Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is April 4th, 2023, and we are here today to hear an amazing story from an amazing couple to answer the question, what happens when your adult Mormon children uh, lose their faith, uh, when you're kind of in your golden years or even your retirement years? And uh, joining us in studio is my partner in truth and righteousness, Margie. Hey, Margie. Hello. Thanks for being here. Yeah, happy to be here. And the couple of the day or of the hour is Rod and Nan Osborne. Hey, guys. Hey, John. Hey, John. Thanks for joining us in the studio. Glad We're, to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we often get requests for just kind of faith journey stories of normal, everyday Mormons. And while there's no such thing as an average, normal, everyday Mormon, everyone's story is unique, we really do feel like today fits that bill. Um, Rod's a convert to the church, or his parents were. We'll talk about that. Nan was a lifelong Mormon. But they've got uh, a really um, powerful and typical, in some ways, Mormon story, up until the point where some of their children as adults start losing their faith. And so that's going to be what we're covering. Some of you may uh, may recognize Nan and Rod, because, or especially Nan, because in addition to being an amazing couple, uh, worthy of a Mormon Stories interview. I think both of you, or at least Nan, appeared briefly on the Hulu documentary, Mormon No More. Their uh, their daughter, Sal, along with Lena, have been on Mormon Stories as a couple, but they mm -hmm. also were featured on the Hulu Mormon No More documentary. That, did I get that right? Yeah. You did. We're both on every episode. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're on it. So yeah. there's... Yeah. There's a lot of us. She's more prominent than me, <laughs> thankfully. Yeah. And Sal and Lena's story is going to play in to your story yes. overall. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's not going to be about that. It's going to be about your story today. Yeah. And, uh, hi, Sal and Lena. Love you guys <laughs> and uh, everyone else. So any um, disclaimers or intentions you all want to set for why you're doing this interview before we jump right in? For me... I'm doing this interview, even though it's a little bit scary, um, in the hopes that what I have experienced and what I um, have been through in the last, just maybe even the last three years, um, that I can use that experience to help other people who are perhaps struggling with some of the same things I did for the last few years. And I feel like I am in such a good place right now that, or a happy place is what I should say, that I can maybe share uh, some of that with other people. And I hope, I hope it does help somebody. And just to be clear, you guys, at least you, Nan, were an Orthodox faithful Mormon for how many years? My entire life. Which I am 61. Be... I've so probably been to church every single Sunday since I was six weeks old. So like yeah. 59 years oh, of yes. ortho Mormon orthodoxy? Oh, yes. And 60. Yeah. And oh, 60. Mm -hmm. So your faith crisis is just one or two years old. So For, yes. You guys mm -hmm. are baby, relative babies. Yes, in the we faith are. And we world. feel like that. Yeah. At least I do. I should speak yeah. for myself. So this is fresh for mm -hmm. Nan and Rod. Very. And Rod, any intention you want to add? Well, uh, I, I echo what, what Nan said. She said it really well about uh, our intentions. Um, yeah, I would just like to be able to help someone with my story. Um, and hopefully that'll happen. Yeah, for sure it will. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, um, now there's always a question of who goes first. I think we decided to have Nan go first because Nan actually has a traditional, more traditional Mormon story. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Rod will have you talk about yours sure. and then your lives will merge at some point. Okay. So Nan, where does your Mormon story begin? <laughs> I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, raised in Ogden, Utah. I'm the oldest of three kids. I have a sister who's just a year younger than me, and then a brother seven years after that. Uh, my sister and I uh, were best friends from the time we were little, and even and forever. Um, I was raised in Ogden. My parents were both uh, descendants of pioneers. Um, Jedediah Grant was my great-great-grandpa. Heber J. Grant is my great-great-uncle. Whoa. Um, Did you know him at all? 
growing up? No. Or no, he would have passed. No. Um, but I knew my great grandma, I knew her growing up and she was his niece. And so I heard stories about him and what he had done for the family, um, my whole life growing up and my dad's side as well. Uh, there were pioneers all throughout his genealogy as well. And as a child, when we had family home evening, a lot of the lessons were about our revered and honored pioneer ancestors. And as a little girl, I remember those lessons and feeling so proud to be part of the line that came from those brave people and all they did. And I was encouraged by my parents to carry on the torch that they have so valiantly started. And uh, that, that had an impact on me growing up. Mm. Um, my childhood was great. Uh, my parents were awesome. What, what did your parents do work-wise? Um, my mom stayed home with us. My dad uh, sold Rosignol skis mm. for uh, most of the time. And then he got sick when I was about 12 or 13. He got sick. Uh, my dad was my best friend. He was the person I went to with any concern, any problems. Um, the first time a boy didn't want to go out with me and I thought he did, then I went to my dad and talked to him. Any, any troubles I had, my dad was a good listener he was fun. He was super cool. All my friends loved him because he was the Rosignol guy. He taught my sister and I how to ski when we were about 10. And then he taught some of my friends so that they could come with us skiing. And uh, he, he was the coolest guy on the block, the coolest guy at church. Um, and he made me feel like he would help me no matter what. He would say to me, no matter what you do wrong, no matter what choice you make, if you land in jail, I will be the one to come and get you. <laughs> when I was about 12, my dad got sick and uh, the doctors couldn't figure it out. They took out his gallbladder and his appendix and everything else and he was still sick. And after a couple of years, they finally diagnosed him with liver cancer. Mm. Um... We were in Ogden. They suggested that he see a doctor at the UCLA hospital. So my parents flew down. They expected to be there a month or two. My grandparents stayed with me and my siblings. And when they opened my dad up to do surgery to take out the part with cancer, they saw that the cancer had already spread to his entire body. It was in his organs and his lungs and everywhere else. So they just closed him back up. And the surgery lasted 15 minutes instead of several hours. Wow. They told my mom, you'll be lucky to have him for three more months. Um, so they came home after only a few days instead of what we thought. And uh, my dad was already in the state presidency. He was probably 35. And um, everyone loved him. And our house became a nonstop line of people coming through our house to say goodbye to him. Night after night, people would come and cry and, and you know, tell him how sorry they were. Um, as a 12, 13, 14-year-old by that time, um, it was uh, scary, but I had so much faith, and my dad had so much faith that we thought, Nah, let's wait and see what really does happen. Um, I, whatever my dad taught, I believed 100%. And he said, we are going to, we are going to outlive this thing and we're going to fix this. And the doctors are all going to be surprised. So of course he had several blessings given to him. Um, some of which said that he would be okay. And some just said, we hope you feel better. Um, my sister and I one night gathered all the money that we had that we'd saved from babysitting and brought it into mom and dad and said, 
you know, we want to give this to you. Maybe this will help pay for medical bills. Um, it was a, it was a rough time. And to see all the people who loved my dad come through made it even more, uh, I just understood even more what an impact he had on our whole community and how it wasn't just me losing him. It was everyone. Um, so when, during that time, my dad didn't get worse. And over the next month or so, he gained 10 pounds. And we were so surprised and happy. And after a couple of maybe three months, he kind of got worse again. And he had to go back in the hospital. And they tried some more things. And he was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And then he came home. And we all tried to help him. And he got a little bit better. And this time, he was better for maybe four or five months. And he got a little bit better and a little bit, and then something happened and he couldn't breathe very well. And we went back and the cancer had spread in his lungs and it went back and forth, back and forth for 15 years. Wow. So never did they say, Oh, he's cured. He's going to be alive forever. That wasn't part of it. It was, is tomorrow the day is next week the day. Once I asked my mom, I was in junior high and I came home and said, our, our awesome field trip that we've been planning forever is going to get canceled because one of the moms can't come. Can you come be a chaperone? And she said, man, that is three weeks away. I could be a widow in three weeks. I cannot sign up for that. Mm. And it was another, um, another indication that I needed to take care of myself. And, and I couldn't be asking my mom things like that. You couldn't say, what are we going to do for Christmas this year? Because that's too far away to think about, even if it's only three weeks. And, and I also learned a lot to keep my fears to myself because it was an indication of a lack of faith if you were overly worried that he was going to die any, any minute. So... Um, I had had faith since I was a little girl. I, I, some of my earliest memories are of praying and being 100% confident that Heavenly Father was listening. Um, when I was in Sunday school, a teacher asked us, when I was young, a teacher asked us to go home and pray to know that God is really there listening. And boy, I followed her assignment and I went home and got on my knees and I started to pray. And I said, well, this is silly. I already know that. I know that as well as if my dad is real. My dad's in the other room. I can't see him. It's the same thing. And I was probably eight at the time. And I just had 100% faith that everything I'd been taught was accurate and worthy of me basing all my actions on that. So, I mean, as an eight-year-old, I was all in, you know, and my whole life has been that. Um, my dad, his illness was the focus of our home from then on. Mm -hmm. um, everything we did was on, can dad do that with us? Is he okay? Will that work? Um, he got better on occasion long enough to participate with us, to, to ski. And we would have a ski day with him and he would do well. And then that ski day wore him out. And a week later he was back in the hospital and needed to be pumped up with whatever new medicine. Um, it, he and my mom, uh, had a really great marriage. They were super in love forever, the whole time. And they didn't want to be apart. And my dad had to quit work before too long. And um, they bought a lazy boy chair for every room in the house. So there was one in the living room, one in the kitchen, one in the bedroom, one in the office. There was even one right outside the bathroom door of where my mom would get ready in the morning and curl her hair and do all her stuff because my dad wanted to be with her every minute daddy had le left. Um... He remained in the stake presidency, even though a lot of the time he couldn't attend the meetings. 
So what happened was that the stake president and the other counselor took care of all that kind of administrative stuff a lot of the time. And my dad became the counselor of anyone who needed help, counseling. So he was in his lazy boy in the office and the door would be closed and we knew somebody from the stake was in there and my dad was listening and talking. And he, as he got worse, you know, more sick, he, he just became uh, softer and more in tune with the spirit. And he helped so many people. Um, mm. I heard a man come in who was just sobbing and said, I would trade my troubles for your troubles. And my dad said, okay, tell me all about it. And he had all kinds of marriage problems and infidelity and all of that. And I heard him cry for a long time in my, in the, in my dad's office. And eventually he left and said, I can never thank you enough. And he came back a lot of times, but it was very frequent. Several times a week, somebody was in our house to just to talk to my dad because he was so good at that. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And I was so proud of him. <coughs> um, yeah. In my eyes, he could do no wrong. Um, mm. I wasn't um, born with a desire to rebel. I just wasn't. So generally speaking, I wasn't in trouble at home. Um, we didn't have a curfew. I didn't ever get grounded. There were no talks like that. Um, it was always, oh, we're so proud of you. You know, uh, you're, you're just, you're just what we hoped for in a daughter kind of thing. So it was all good. Um, did you relate to Nephi in the scriptures <laughs> a little bit as like the faithful child? Well, my, my brother and sister Rod's weren't naughty. rotten kids. Um, so it's not like I was the... I didn't say were they Laban and Lemuel. But no, you, but no, you not at all. With I, uh, that, that didn't cross my mind, oh. but I just most of all wanted to make my dad proud yeah. above all else. Mm. Um, mm. I spent my high school years sitting on the side of his bed, either at home or in the hospital. Mm. Um, I, every day after school... If he was in the hospital, I drove straight to the hospital and spent an hour or two there. If he was home, I came home and sat on the side of his bed for a little while. That's where a lot of our talks happened as I was a teenager. That's why I became a nurse. Um, mm, I can so see that. Yeah. One day I was at the hospital and he was in, when I showed up after high school, he was in so much pain. And I said, Dad, haven't you asked for more pain medicine? And he said, yeah, I pressed the buzzer, but she, she's really busy, so it'll probably be a while. And I said, all right, I'm going out there and I'm going to ask her. And he said, oh, no, you're not. Those nurses are working so hard. They're, they're working harder than they should have to work already. And I appreciate whatever they do for me, and we're not going to go out and demand anything. So I sat there with him, and finally, 20 minutes later, a nurse came in and put some medicine in his IV, and he just calmed down. I could just see the effects. And I was so grateful for that nurse. I wanted to just hug her and hug her and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, uh, When I got home, I thought about writing a thank you note to her. But then every time I went, I just started noticing how the nurses were so good and were so kind. And my dad was kind back. And I felt like I would need to write 10 thank you notes every shift. And I just said, someday I want to be that nurse. And I want to do for somebody else's dad what she does for my dad. So... Um, I uh, finished high school and uh, applied to the nursing program at Weber State College um, in Ogden. My parents, I said, I, would, I think I'd like to go to BYU. And they said, oh, no, honey, 
if you go to BYU, you'll, you'll meet somebody from somewhere else, and he'll want to take you somewhere else, and we want you right here close to us. That was my mom's talk to me. <laughs> and so I said, oh, good idea, Mom. And I never asked about it again. <laughs> and um, the, pro, the nursing program was three years, but a few of us uh, that were doing well in high school um, were allowed to take all the prerequisites while we were in the nursing school part. So I finished in two years. Hmm. And uh, I was only 17 when I graduated high school. So by the time I was 19, I was a registered nurse. Hmm. And uh, I started working, and I've loved being a nurse. Um, that's, that's the basic synopsis of my childhood. Uh, it was great. My, both of my parents were great. Um, I've always felt responsible. I think that was another thing I was born with, is feeling responsible to make sure everybody else was okay. Yeah. So if I had to ask my very earliest memory of forever, it would probably be when I went to kindergarten and I was worried about leaving my sister, who was a year younger. And I remember telling her, you're going to be okay. Mom will take care of you while I'm gone. I won't be gone that long. It's okay. In whatever five-year-old way I could convey that to her. I remember a couple of years later, me getting my tonsils out and spending the night in the hospital. And when we took my sister to my grandparents' house before I got my tonsils out, I said the same thing. You're going to be okay. I, I promise I'll get better fast as I can so that I can come back to you fast. But grandma and grandpa will take care of you. So those kind of feelings were just in me when I was born. And I felt um, while my dad was sick that I, I wanted to do everything I could to make sure my mom was okay and that she wasn't overburdened, to make sure whatever I could do for my dad, I would do. Um, you know, if I was having issues with girlfriends or with school or something, I didn't come home and say, oh, what am I going to do about this? Because I knew my dad might die next week. My problems were minuscule compared to this. Mm. And... So I didn't ever say that. My sister and I, even still today, can't remember one time when we had an argument. Not about clothes, not about anything our whole lives, because we both knew that wasn't worth, um, you know, Stressing bringing up. up. Yeah. The yeah. thing that's so interesting to me about that is how long, you know... I think for those developmental years, you're a child, you're, you know, kind of going into your teen years, it sounds like when it really hits, that for a couple years, that would be one thing like, oh, you know, to have that as the center. And then you kind of are always checking your needs like, oh, but compared to that, I probably shouldn't have this need or, you know, having that as a focal point. The fact that it went on through your whole development, that is, that to me is such, wow, a major, major player in how you got to know yourself. And like you say, how you literally showed up in that system to really assuage suffering, to take care of, to create, uh, to eliminate suf any suffering from you, like to add. And that to me, I just feel like is so, so insightful. And um, also, um, I, I feel like it, it's interrupting another self that might have emerged during that time that would have been, you know, truly like free you, authentic you, because, you know, you were kind of born in that place of real pain and loss, mm -hmm. always looking you in the face. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I have so much like love for uh, <laughs> the younger young man. you. And what was it like? Do you do you remember what you would do with your feelings as you were witnessing your dad suffer in some of those harder times? Was mm -hmm. that 
Do you remember or any of that? Or if you had your own needs that you probably were packing down and stuffing. Exactly. Because you were always attending to everyone else's mm-hmm. needs or mm-hmm. worried about disrupting the peace. Mm-hmm. Which you've spoken to already, but... It took me many, many years, decades, before I realized that that probably wasn't a very healthy way to grow into an adult. Um, At the time, it did not cross my mind because I was thinking about my dad. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't think of it as a sacrifice. I didn't think of it as... um, Oh, I have to do this because I'm the daughter and I'm the eldest and I should do this. Not at all. It was an honor to look after my dad or to, you know, be concerned about my mom. And a lot of the things I'm describing, you know, my two siblings will probably say, what? We don't remember Nan taking care of everybody. It's not like I was 15 and, you know, running the house at all. A lot of it was what I was feeling inside in my heart of that I was worried and that I I would come home on the school bus and think, okay, I'm not going to bring this up, my issue that I had today at school. Uh, you know, I don't need to. Or I'll talk to my sister about it. Just because I knew they didn't have the bandwidth for that. Mm-hmm. And that was yeah. okay. Yeah. I knew that if things were, you know, quote, normal, that sure, they would be open to talking to me. But I knew that I needed to take care of myself, and uh, so I did. Maybe we'll circle back to that theme um, yeah. as, as you deconstruct it and process mm-hmm. that later on. Okay. Mm-hmm. But th- those are great insights. Thanks for helping. Yeah, because there inherently there's a, a disconnect that happens when we're showing up for others that it kind of interrupts that process of us actually connecting with ourselves, right, and uh, what our needs might look like and yeah. what they would be, let alone being able to vocalize them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. that, that's exactly how it was. And, but I was so unaware of that. Yeah. And, you know, every church meeting, every sacrament meeting we would go to, somebody would make a comment about my mom and they would say, oh, look at her. She, it, look at her. She's here with her kids. She's smiling. We went over to visit, uh, her last night with her husband and we thought we were bringing them you know, cheer and good wishes, but we were the ones that left feeling buoyed up and that everything's going to be okay. So my mom was praised for her um, stoic way of handling this. In all of those years, 15 years, I didn't see my mom cry. Mm. Not once. Um, She kept it together and she was proud of that very proud. And she made it known to me that that was the way we should be handling this, that, uh, will, we can take care of this. We, we don't open up to discuss how we really feel inside with everybody else. My mom didn't do that with anyone anyway about anything. And so this was even more that way. And that's what I learned. That reminds me of just survival. Mm -hmm. Right. That if you kind of lean in and you kind of go more toward grief and reflection and we may not be able to wake up tomorrow morning and do what needs to be done or so real, which makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. coping. Yeah. Yeah. Really quickly before we jump to Rod, uh, can you talk in your, let's just say mid to late teen years, what the role of the church was doctrinally, theologically, in your life, so okay. prayer, scripture, study, uh-huh. your beliefs, your relationship with God in the church. I, I can assume that, but I'd yes. just like to hear you speak to it. Yes. Um, the church was everything for our family and for me. Um, I prayed every single night before I went to bed, mostly on my knees. I believed every word out of the prophet's mouth. I, you know, we weren't a family who at state conference, we just didn't go or general conference. We didn't listen. No way. It was everybody get ready. We're going to watch general conference. Um, I was happy to have the church in my life and so grateful that they made so many of the decisions for me 
and I didn't have to decide, mm, should I try alcohol? Should I date this boy? Uh, those decisions were already made for me. And I was, I thought it was the greatest thing ever. Like I had the greatest, you know, life hack that all those decisions were already made. So I didn't have to. And I was, I knew they were the right decisions and that they would bring me the most happiness now as a teenager and later. Um, I, you know, I wasn't a kid who squirmed around in primary and Sunday school. No way. I was there. I was young women's, you know, talking to the teacher afterwards about what the lesson was just on and all of that. Very willing to participate in every single thing the church offered. Um, youth conference, girls camp, all those things were just wonderful. Um, and I was really happy. I didn't dread going to girls camp. I just was so excited. And this is going to be the greatest thing ever. And we're going to help those young beehives build their testimonies and all of that. So I was, I was all in, I was a seminary vice president of our school in Ogden where there's everybody takes seminary and I got to, you know, lead the early morning testimony meetings, things like that. I was, um, faithful without any desire to know anything else flat out. So yeah, it was great. I can only imagine, particularly for just even the stabilizing force of that. Mm -hmm. I can I can only imagine. I do have a quick question. You know, at any time during those years where your dad was sick, did it ever affect your testimony or make you question around, you know, I think some of the messaging or conditioning can be if you do all the things then you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Or if you do all the things, you will be protected. But you actually are living an experience young where someone you love who is so inspiring and such a beautiful human, an example of doing all, all the good and right things, uh, did that ever strike you in a way that felt confronting? Not one single bit. Um, I, my dad was really careful that he didn't talk like that. He and my mom didn't talk like, oh, uh, the blessing you got tonight, honey, that really gives me confidence that you're going to get cured and you're going to be all better. That kind of talk didn't happen in our house. We, we talked about how much faith we had that Heavenly Father knew what we were going through. He was aware of us, each one of us, and that he knew what he was doing. Um, my dad talked to me about, like, I came home from seminary one time. I was 16. I came home and I said, Dad, why, you're the greatest person I've ever known. Why are you the one to get cancer? Why are are you the one to suffer for so long mm -hmm. and then worry about leaving your wife and kids and all of that? And he got out the scriptures. He asked me, bring me my scriptures because he was in bed. He wasn't doing well at that particular time. And uh, he opened up to the man who built his house on a rock. And he read those scriptures to me, just a few verses. And he said, we have built this family on a rock and I have built my life on a rock, he said. And true, it's raining and the winds are howling and it's coming down really hard right now. It feels like the worst rainstorm we could ever have. But by dang, we are built on a rock and we will not fall. Mm. And I remember, you know, everything about that day. And I believed it 100%. I didn't, I don't think that I or anyone in our family ever prayed, oh, make dad better, all the way better and all that. We just said, we are so grateful for the good doctors. We are grateful for this new medicine they're trying. Um, we're grateful for the ward that fasted for him again. Things like that. And uh, I'm sure that was 
on purpose on my parents' part that we we didn't expect everything to get better. And um, I don't think that was discussed very much. So no, it didn't cause me any any concern. Well, the, I don't know how to describe it, but I my faith did not falter because of this. On the contrary, I my faith just got stronger. If my dad can be this strong, if he can be that kind to the nurses when they're so late bringing him pain medicine, if he can suffer through this and never ever utter a complaint ever, not one time, then uh, no matter what happens to me, I'm not going to complain, no matter what. So that was, that was the vibe in our home. And uh, yeah. Beautiful, powerful. Thanks. <clears throat> I mean, this helps me understand you a lot uh, <laughs> in all the good ways. So thanks. I, I will say it's really interesting for me to, to hear you describe both your mom as a, in this major caretaker role for years and years and describing her as like just unfalter, like un, unfailing, stoic, not really seeing her cry. Um, and then it sounds like your dad also, on the other hand, uh, that your experience of him was very, you know, just committed and uh, optimal altruism. And it leads like, so that what you saw was so, uh, like certain emotions and certain behaviors were so optimized, right? Like that sacrifice or hard work from your mom, the otherness, mm -hmm. um, and caretaking, um, being so ide that's so idealized in the church, she's getting that every Sunday. And then your dad doing the same thing where it's like you don't see him maybe reflect about life or sadness or or why this is happening or some of those emotions. It's only like, you know, affirming kind of stalwartness and obedience and mm -hmm. optimal perspective at and I think there's such a there's such so much to be gained from that that should be honored from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And it also leaves out a whole other side to human experience, to like the whole experience of what it means to be alive with loss and grief and, and feeling angry sometimes mm -hmm. or feeling. So it's so interesting to, to hear you describe that life and that experience of, of kind of growing up because there's such a, it, almost perfectionism. Yeah. Like this optimization of what things should look like, even under extreme stress, uncertainty and duress. Yes. yes. That was, that was exactly how it was. Um, my mom expected herself to be perfect. She, uh, kept a perfect house. She kept herself looking perfect. And, uh, even through all of that. So I grew up just knowing that that's what's expected of a mom and of a wife. Uh, and you know, she taught it, she taught it well by example. Um, the phrase was often said in our home, like heavenly father has a plan we may not know what it is right now. Uh, this isn't the plan we thought he would have for us, but he's got a plan. And our job is to have faith in him and what he's going to do with us. And as my dad got to the end of his life and he was counseling people, somebody would leave the house after telling him all their troubles and him gently talking them through it he would come out and say, we are so lucky. Our family is so lucky that we don't have any of that, um, that we all love each other and are here for each other. And so it was reinforced all the time that what we were doing by having faith and by being strong and not complaining and not bringing up anything else was the right thing to do. That was reinforced a lot. 
Okay, and before we jump to Rod, one last quick question. We've talked a lot about your dad, mm -hmm. even though it's kind of your story. And I think your story is framed by your dad's uh, health and your family's system organized around your dad's health. Mm -hmm. Spend 30 seconds talking about what Nan, things Nan loved to do, grow, grow you know, okay. her passions or pursuits, just so we can get a flavor yeah. for a few other things about like sports or Okay. Yeah. Um, I was not born an athlete and it didn't interest me and I'm not super coordinated and not athletic. So that wasn't a big part of my life. But because my dad worked for Rosignol Ski Company, he taught us to ski when I was 10 and in fifth grade. And oh man, that was uh, so much fun. And in the beginning, it was a family activity. Every weekend we'd go up and he'd teach us more or help my sister learn and then my brother learn. Um, and as I became a teenager, growing up in Ogden, all, all of my friends skied. Most of us had season passes and we lived for ski season. So, you know, Halloween would come and we would, if it could just snow by Halloween, then the ski resort could be open by Thanksgiving and we could be on the slopes. Um... Half the guys I dated probably asked me out just because they thought my dad was so cool and they wanted to date his daughter so that someday they could be in my dad's family. So a lot of the boys I dated were skiers. We went skiing on dates. Um, it was a really big part of my uh, junior high and high school life. I... I was in the choir at school, things like that. I got great grades. I, uh, you know, was involved in all the seminary and youth activities. Um, but skiing, if I had to say one thing that I enjoyed, that was a big part of who I was. I had an old beat up station wagon when I was a teenager. So the deal was if I was getting A's, my parents said, you can skip school to go skiing. So after first period, of course, there were no cell phones. I would go to the attendance office and sign myself out and then go if we saw it was a blue sky day. And then I would go and get my like five friends and go talk to them. Hey, let's go skiing. Hey, let's go. And they would all come sign themselves out. We would all pile into my station wagon. I would go drop them at each one of their houses, go to my house, get my ski gear, put it in, then go pick the five of them up, put their gear in, and we could be on the mountain in an hour from when we all signed out of school and ski mm -hmm. all day. And I did that a lot. My, my junior and senior year, that was what I did. And that was super fun. Mm -hmm. So my life uh, was a lot about skiing when I wanted to do something. Love fun. it. And uh, I taught you guys are still skiing, what, weekly to this day? Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's fun. Now that we're it. back in Utah, we're yeah. skiing a lot. It's yeah. been really fun. Okay. Well, Nan, that's been, that, I think that's a really important foundation that we laid and Margie, yeah. your questions were amazing too. So thanks for sharing Nan, th those early years. You're welcome. Thanks. Rod, you ready to go? I'm ready. Let's your do Mormon, this. Your Mormon story is a little different. It is. It All is. right. Let's, uh, let's have, let's have you. Okay. Tell a bit about <clears throat> yours. Uh, yeah, mine's quite different. Um, my parents, uh, grew up, uh, in a, uh, a coal town in Southeastern West Virginia. Uh, one of my grand, my dad's dad was a coal miner and my mom's dad was, uh, had polio as a child and had a brace on his leg and walked with a limp and therefore he couldn't work in the mine. So he was, he ran the, uh, the local furniture and appliance store. Uh, my parents were high school sweethearts. Um, my mom got married at 17 to my dad, uh, while she was still in high school. And uh, he took off, joined the Air Force to, so he didn't have to work in the coal mines. Um, and uh, hmm. that got them out of West Virginia. Not to, West Virginia is not a great place, um, but uh, dad wanted to, to get out. So uh, in a period of nine years, uh, they had five kids and I was number two of the five. Um, I was born in Ohio, and we lived in a 
in a single wide trailer there. I can remember that. And uh, I remember uh, being on my dad's shoulders while he went pheasant hunting just right out in the field next to our, our trailer. Um, and uh, my life as a child was, uh, I have great memories of, of my, my childhood. Um, I have, uh, both of my grandfathers uh, were religious guys. Um, and uh, they went to the local Methodist church in, uh, in Annawalt, West Virginia, which uh, is a ghost town now pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember as a, as a kid, um, we, didn't, we didn't go to church. I remember going to church a couple times while my dad, who was in the Air Force, was in Thailand during the Vietnam War. My mom took us to church a couple times. I think, uh, you know, uh, obvious reasons. Um, but uh, I remember my grandpa one time on my dad's side, uh, we were, my dad said, yeah, we went hunting last Sunday. And my, my grandpa said, what? You should watch what you do on Sundays. Manuel, my dad's name is Manuel. And I was 12 at the time. And somehow I still remember that. Uh, it, it just hit home to me. Well, you know, this, this is a, this is a real religious guy. If he's talking to us about Sunday I, and I really had no concept of church. I went to church a few times, but, uh, we were not a religious family, but anyway, um, the five of us, uh, grew up on mil uh, air force bases, um, uh, three years in Spain, uh, as a, as a little kid, I have great memories of that. Um, and then uh, North Carolina, uh, where most of my early years were spent, we were a we were a, a sports family. Um, I started playing football when I was eight. Baseball, I think, was seventeen. As I was seven, and uh, pretty much our lives revolved around what we did in sports uh, as kids. I loved that. Uh, I also was really interested in school. I, I, you know, I had a curious mind. Um, when I wasn't doing anything at school or I finished my assignments, I would just go get an encyclopedia and start reading it. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I was a curious kid. Um, but we, uh, we moved around. Uh, we, we moved uh, from North Carolina to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Very few people have ever lived there. <laughs> um, Upers, Yeah, we were we were Upers for a while. And that was fun. Um, and then uh, we lived, we were at Clark Air Base in the Philippines for a couple of years um, during the 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 height of the Vietnam War. There, it was a it was the biggest military installation in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, then we moved to Utah. Uh, summer of my sophomore year. Um, summer before my sophomore year. Uh, I had no idea what Utah was like. Um, when Dad got the assignment, we just said... Oh, Hill Air Force Base. Hill Air Force Base, oh, exactly. Oh, so you were in LDS when you moved to... We were Bunkin not. Uh, okay. Nope, uh, not at all. Um, I remember, <coughs> pardon me, uh, when, when I told uh, my friend about our assignment when we were in the Philippines, I was in the ninth grade at the time, so we're going to Utah. He said, oh, my gosh, really? I said, what? He says, uh, you better watch out for the Mormons. And I, I had no idea what a Mormon was. Um, really? I had no idea, no, none whatsoever. Um, I just knew we were going to a desert because I remember traveling across the states to go to San Francisco in order to catch the plane to the Philippines. We crossed through Utah, and Utah was a desert. Um, that's all. That's the only memory I had. But... Um, we moved there as a family. My 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 brother was a senior at the time, which was really hard for him to, you know, to leave during that time. But for me, it was a great time to, you know, right before my high school years. And um, uh, I remember the the first day of school as a sophomore. I was, uh, you know, I was probably five seven and uh, uh, you know packing one hundred fifteen pounds and. Um, I was holding a tackling dummy. We were we were uh, we were at football practice. I was holding a tackling dummy, and little old me and this senior came and hit the tackling dummy. And uh, I knew as soon as I got hit, something was wrong. And I 
and I uh, woke up and my my wrist was uh, hanging down in kind of a V shape, and uh, yeah, it just snapped both the bones in my right. in my wrist. So so my introduction to high school was uh, uh, was not so great. So you know, I broke my arm. And, um, my first year in in Utah was uh, uh, I had no friends other than the friends that I had on the Air Force Base. Even at school, I remember. Um, until, uh, well, again, uh, once my arm healed, then I got into baseball. I played a lot of baseball, and so I was, um, um, I, uh, I made the varsity team as a, as a sophomore. And, um, th- my, my involvement in sports, uh, was a lot of my uh, th- self-esteem probably, um, but anyway, uh, you know, I didn't have any Mormon friends. I didn't know any Mormon friends until uh, the latter part of my junior year um, when uh, there was this girl that took some interest in me, and I I was pretty much introverted. Um, and uh, she made the first move, and then uh, eventually we became, you know, to like each other. And, and uh, I remember the summer before my senior year, uh, we did a lot of stuff together, and uh, um, right after football season as a senior, I was at Layton High School. Uh, her name was Lark Harris, great person. Um, we, uh, I, I was baptized. I took the, uh, the missionary discussions from her brother. At that time, they didn't have missionaries in Utah. It was all stake missionaries, so this was 1973. Um uh, so I, I took the, the missionary discussions, um, and I'm sure the question is, why did you take the missionary discussions? Uh, and, you know, as I look back, I took them for probably, uh, you know, a, a couple of reasons. One is that she paid a lot of attention to me, and it was her family was great. Um, you know, I, I, I went over there, had Sunday dinner with them most almost every week. Um, uh, Lark and I were really close. Um, and they were a really kind family. They had, you know, they were, again, a, you know, a pioneer family. They'd been there forever. Um, so it was, it was that part of it. And then uh, I, I think I had a desire to connect with something spiritual. I remember... Um, I went to church on my own with a friend of mine. His name was Diz Reese. Um, in when when I was at Hill Air Force Base, when we were still living on the base, while I was in high school, Diz and I would uh, on a Sunday morning we'd go up to the base and go to the chapel, and you know it was an hour service. It was just a basic Protestant service. They in the Air Force you have Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish services on the base, and. You have to fit into one of those three categories. Not LDS. No. Interesting. No, not at all. Um, so I did that. In uh, so I I did have, you know, some desire to connect with deity or something spiritual, and then uh, so it wasn't really out of the out of uh, outer space for me to say, okay, I'll listen to the missionaries, because I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't um, indoctrinated against the Mormons so much, except for my friend in the Philippines. Uh, and when I got here, I said, hey, these guys are, you know, Lark's certainly nice, and her family's great. Um, and I didn't know much about the Mormons. But when I took the missionary discussions, uh, it felt good. And um, I said, okay. And I, got, and I was baptized November 17th. 1973. Um, Mm. And uh, I was, there was never a time after that until within the last two years that I wasn't a true believing Mormon. Uh, I was always active, even though you know, the years between the time I was baptized and the time I went on a mission at age 21, you know, there were some rocky times um, where, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do in college, yada, yada, and uh, Lark and I had broken up, we'd get back together, that kind of thing. 
um, there was never a time that I wasn't going to church and fully engaged in what I thought I was supposed to do. Hmm. Uh, as a convert, um, I really believed that I should do what I was told. Um, so in a nutshell, that's my childhood and my, my, uh, you know, my teenage years. I love my childhood. Um, my parents, uh, I think, uh, you know, we weren't a perfect family. There were plenty of flaws, um, but my parents did the best they could. You know, my, my siblings, we, we still communicate. Nobody, nobody hates anybody. Um, uh, my dad is still alive. He's going to be 92 this year. Um, he lives up in Hooper, Utah. I have two sisters and a brother that are still local. And uh, one brother that lives uh, up in the Seattle area. So, um, yes. Did, did how did your parents feel about you converting to Mormonism? You know, they um, they didn't say much. Okay. Yeah, they uh, they were fine with it. Uh, they didn't say yes or no, um, and uh, they just pretty let me well let me do what I wanted, you know. Now, when I when I said I was going to go on a mission, I think there was some, you know, a little bit of hesitancy, but they didn't put up any resistance uh, when I did. I I, I went uh, when I was twenty one, not when I was nineteen. So I was twenty one and a half when I left. Where'd you go? To Texas Dallas mission. Hmm. Yeah, in those days there were only three missions in Texas. And what years were you in Dallas? I was there seventy seven to seventy nine. Hmm. Would you believe I lived in Dallas in seventy seven? No, <laughs> did you really? <laughs> in the Richardson area. Oh, I, I was in the Richardson ward for the the last. Uh, well, a big. I, I was I was the mission. I called myself the mission gopher. Uh -huh. uh, for a while, I was a, called the supply manager in the Richardson ward. That's where the mission home was. Uh, so in, we but it was 1978. Yeah. Pardon me. We were there around the same time. Really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Texas. Do you remember the ACs? I do. So we were, yeah. No were, kidding. They were close. You know, uh, uh, President Benson's son was also in the Richardson ward while we were there. And mm. yeah, he had a couple of cute daughters that, that were in the ward. We, we Such a noticed. small Mormon world. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> You're a Mormon. It is a small world. Yeah. 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 Um, so in a nutshell, that's my, my childhood, lots of sports. What was it like being a missionary as a convert? You know, I, I was, uh, I resisted a mission. Um, it was a, you know, when you're, when you're a 19 year old kid, um, and this is the way I thought in my mind, uh, two years I said, you know, I said to myself, that's my junior and senior year in high school. That's, that's a long time. I can't mm -hmm. imagine just going and knocking on doors for two years and giving up. I wanted to play uh, sports. I wanted to play baseball in, um, in college, and I thought giving that up would be just like, I, don't, I can't do that, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. It was, uh, however, you know, um, eventually I, I was, I was playing, well, I, I skipped that part after, after I graduated, I went to Utah Tech at Provo, which was a little tiny school across the street from BYU. It was a junior college. So UVSC predecessor? It is. Okay. And, uh, I walked on as a, you know, as a freshman Baseball. and at baseball, uh, a, my buddy and I, uh, Brian Graham, uh, who eventually went to Utah and played, but uh, we walked on. I was starting as at second base. Uh, I played through the fall season, and and then my girlfriend Lark was at BYU at the time. She left to go back to Weber State, and she left me there um, at Utah Tech, and I just couldn't handle it. Even though I was starting, the season was going to start in two weeks. I quit baseball 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that just shows you the, my mental maturity at the time. I, I had really no direction. And, uh, you know, I gave baseball up as saying that I was going to go home and go on a mission. Um, and uh, I went back home and I actually did say, okay, I want to go on a mission. But um, at that time, you know, if you'd done anything wrong, I don't want to go into any details, but... Uh, um, you had to talk to General 30. I did. Um, no, I'm not saying you did. I'm saying I did, then. though. <laughs> oh, okay. You I were right on the you. We're on the same wavelength here, yeah, John. I was just saying. Yeah. Back in the day, if you had done some things wrong, you had to talk, interview with the General 30 prior to serving him. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and... and um, I, don't think they, well, I don't think they do that anymore. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't yeah. think they do either. Yeah. But at that time... Um, they said, "Okay, we're going to have to we're going to have to ask the general authority if you can go." So they had, they talked to the general authority, came back and say, "Well, you you need to wait until the fall." So this was in the spring, and again, fall for me. I mean, that was that was like six months later. That was forever, and uh, what it did was got me really discouraged, and um, I floundered around. I I went to school. I quit school. I withdrew from a whole some, uh, quarter at Weaver State, which is still on my st- transcripts. You know, all the W's on, you know, like 18 hours, 18 credit hours. It doesn't look good. But I was uh, up and down uh, until, um, you know, for a couple of years. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Even though I was still going to church, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know how I was going to get on a mission until... Finally, I just decided, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. So at 21, uh, I decided to put in my papers. That's when I had to go see the general authority. Mm-hmm. I remember I, was, uh, I had a full-time job as a painter while I was going to school for the Davis School District. And uh, I put my suit in my car, and at, at lunchtime— I asked my boss if I could take a couple hours off. Actually, it was pretty much the rest of the day. And I took my paint clothes off in my car, put my suit on, and traveled down to the church office building and met with a guy named Henry D. Taylor, who was a 70 at the time. You know, went up to his office. He asked me all the questions, and um, he didn't tell me anything at the time. He says, well, we'll get back to you. And uh, I got back. Uh, and then uh, the next day, state president called, said, hey, you, you're okay to go. Hmm. And so, you know, in those days, I got my call in two weeks, and I was gone within six weeks. So, hmm. yeah, in my mission experience, uh, I don't know if you want me to talk about that yet. Just, but, yeah, summarize, like, was it powerful? Was it, was it formative for you? It was uh, – it was – You know, I thought at the time it was a great accomplishment for me because I thought I would never do it, you know. Uh, it was uh, very scary to think, oh, crap, I've gotta, I'm have got going to be gone for two years, and that was a long time. Uh, I had a good mission. I was obedient. I did everything that I was supposed to do, um, knocked on doors all day, every day for about two years, um, one thing that, that really bothered me uh, when I got on my mission um, was that um, the, when you get off the plane uh, on a hot August day in, uh, in Dallas, oh, so stuffy and hot, you have your interview with the mission president. That's the first thing you do. And I remember going and sitting in front of this guy, and he was an admiral in the Navy. He, just, he retired to, to, because they asked him to come on a mission. Great guy. I love the man. Uh, um, uh, Seaman Rohart was his name. But anyway, I sat down with him, and the first thing he did was chastise me about what I had done before my mission. And I, and I thought to myself, wait a minute here. I, all this stuff, stuff that I've gone through to get here, I thought it was over with. You know, what, you know, repentance, what I had been taught was, number one, things are confidential, and number two, once, once you've repented, it's done and it's over with. And I was really disappointed that I get there and that's the first thing I hear. Uh, mm-hmm. um, but 
you know, from him, I can understand he's, uh, you know, he's used to, he was used to working with these young Navy sailors who were wild and crazy, and he just didn't want any of that kind of stuff to happen on his watch, you know. Um, and I got over that, and I was fine, and, you know, I learned to love the guy. He was, he had a big heart, and he was, a, as a mission president, he was a great guy. He was, he was um, a moral, wonderful man. He was not the kind of mission president that we hear about who's, trying to get numbers by baptizing kids who are, you know, in, in bad ways. He, he wasn't that kind of guy. Do you feel like the mission was good for your kind of work ethic and character, that sort of thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it was, it was, uh, you know, you learn a lot of valuable lessons. Uh, I think I grew up, I, I learned how to work. Um, you know, I was always a good student, uh, and I did work, you know, I, I had a job at age 16, you know, and I, I juggled work, school, and sports my whole life. And, you know. So you had that. You had a lot of that going I in. did. And I thought, I thought uh, you know, the mission for me was uh, it was hard. It was really hard um, just to be gone that long and be away from friends and family. And, uh, you know, in those days you couldn't call, even though I, I broke the rules and uh, I had the, this was my philosophy as a missionary. I can't make phone calls, but if I get a phone call, nobody told me that I can't take that phone call. So, <laughs> you know, I held on to that. So, so my girlfriend called a few times and my parents would call occasionally, you know, but, mm. uh, uh, yeah, for the most part, it was a good experience. Uh, but, uh, there's some later trauma that we can talk about later that that reared its head um actually just a few years ago okay a mm. major event in my life you let's, know with my missions Nan and margie let's make sure you guys help us remember to remind rod yeah. okay is that all right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay sure really quickly rod you talk about you know being studious as a kid and yeah. reading encyclopedias and stuff yeah and you know we've had sandra tanner on quite a bit of uh, you know by the 70s, she would have been, she and Gerald would have been going full force. Yes. So I'm curious how Mormon history and doctrine and theology struck you as a, as a convert and as an outsider that mm -hmm. tried to be studious. So Golden Plates, Joseph Smith, polygamy. Yeah. Just all the, the crazy stuff about Mormon history. Did that, did you even think of, you know, the claim that the Native Americans were Lamanites, like... Did you ever think about any of that stuff as a convert, as a missionary? Did you ever, were you ever confronted by the, quote, anti-Mormon stuff of the Tanners? Even the the Southern evangelical, you know, anti-Mormon stuff you might have gotten just from, from Baptists in Texas. Right. Was there any confrontation with weird Mormon history or doctrine or theology? Or no? <coughs> Pardon me. Um, you know, I, I, I told you I did what they told me to do. So one of the, the things that I was told back then is never to read anti-Mormon stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't. Um, Gerald and Sandra Tanner were swear words back then. Um, and uh, so I never did um, read anything. I was aware, of course, of the, the ban, the, the priesthood ban against the blacks, because, you know, some of my best friends were... Diz Reese, my friend I went to church with, who was black, um, is black. You know, dear friends. Some of my dear friends are, you know, uh, African-Americans. And um, that bothered me, but it didn't bother me enough not to join the church. And I, you know, I feel bad about that. But... Uh, and, uh, okay, where was I? John, help me out here. Anti -Mormon, senior moment. Anti-Mormon literature. Oh, yeah, yeah, tanners. yeah. Um, we stayed away from we it. were taught yeah. not to do that. Yeah. And, and you know, Mormonism, shadow of reality was like, no, you, you hmm. that is evil. If yeah. you touch that book or you look at that, you, you look at the cover, then you're going to, you know, you're going to get struck down. It was, okay. No, I didn't, didn't do anything like that. I did, though. On my mission, I I read a lot. I read, you know, Jesus the Christ. I read, you know, uh, all of the books that they gave us. Marvelous Work and a Wonder and uh, The Great Apostasy. Uh, 
Talmadge and Woodstow. Yes. And it was, you know, it was the library they gave you. So I, you know, I read all those and, uh, but I did, we had a, we had a member who had in those days, a Deseret book library at their house. So this is a little Texas town. Uh, I, I was serving in Abilene at the time. And, uh, one of the members of the church had a Deseret book shop in her house. They used to do that wow. uh, where they would sell to the local members books from Deseret book. And you could go that. in there and it was like a little store. Hmm. So I, I bought a, a biography of Joseph Smith and I read it. We weren't supposed to read outside books, but I said, oh, this is Joseph Smith. You know, how bad can it be? I don't feel like I'm breaking the rules. And in that book, uh, I think it was the first biography that had been published by a Mormon that mentioned that he had a uh, had it said that in in one part of the story it's very brief that Joseph had married his first plural wife and it didn't go into any more detail than that uh, in the book but that was the first time I ever knew that Joseph had a plural wife. And it um, it was surprising. But I didn't have any way of following up on that because I wasn't supposed to read anything else. And so I never did. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So anything else about mission or post-mission prior to meeting Nan that, that's really important to your story? Uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming you met her pretty soon after getting home from your mission. It was post-mission, uh-huh. Yeah. Is there anything important? Is there anything important, hon? It's more important than meeting Nan. What yeah. No, there's Everything nothing more important than that. But, disappeared but, once but her, 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 her version of, uh, of how we met is uh, more interesting than mine, so I'll let, <laughs> okay. let her handle that. Let me just part. maybe to summarize your section, Rob. Sure. Do you feel like up until the point you meet Nan, do you feel like your introduction to Mormonism, the Mormon church, the Mormon community, your mission experience was a net positive influence on your life? Yes. Yeah, I can say that. Yeah. Um, it gave me direction. You know, I, I didn't really have any after high school. And uh, yeah, it, it, gave me, it gave me direction. Sounds like it gave you community, friendships. Oh, community, yeah. I mean, in the Mormon church, you, I mean, frankly, that's something they do better than anybody I know is create community, right? If you are if you fit in, you fit in real well. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Now, any, Marty, you want anything? You're good? Okay. All right. So I guess we want to hear the story of how you guys met. Okay. Go for it. <laughs> um, I was in nursing school at Weber State. My mom was attending a um, institute class with a friend of hers and uh, at the school. And she said, there's this really cute boy in my institute class. You should come over and meet him. I was only 18. I went over the next day that she was in institute and the boy wasn't there. And I said, drat. And some boy in the <laughs> class said, uh, you let your mom find you dates? And I said, hey, I'm open to anything, you know. <laughs> and he said, well, I've got a friend who needs a date. Maybe maybe you should go out with him. And I said, send him my way, you know. And uh, so he got our house address from my mom. And a few nights later, I came home from a date with a boy I thought was really cute. And my dad said, hey a boy came looking for you tonight. And I said, really? And uh, what did he look like? And he said, he made that boy you were out with tonight look like a mud fence post. Whoa. <laughs> and I, I he's said, not watching now. Wow. A mud <laughs> fence post. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, wow, okay then. I better go back and see if I can't find him at Institute or wherever. So uh, I went back. Did I don't know if we met at Institute. I don't think we did. Did we? We did. Even before we went on our That's first date? That's the first date? time he saw you. And oh, explain really? to our non-Mormon viewers and listeners what Institute is. Institute is um, religion classes for college students. 
and community members if they want to come. It was on campus. Um, this is at Weber. Uh huh. At Weber in Ogden, and uh, it was. It also had a cafeteria and a place we could have dances and. Uh, fun times and activities. So it was definitely a place where um, a lot of young kids hung out to meet meet people and all that kind of so stuff. So on the campus, let me let me make sure I get this right. On the campus of a public university, mm-hmm. Weber State University, the Mormon Church builds an institute building mm-hmm. on campus that's kind of like a student life center for faith and an education religious education center. For faithful believing Mormons, is yes. that right? Is that right, Rod? Um, it, as far as being on campus, I, I, like, I can't tell you. It's just here's the road. Here was where most of the campus is, and here's the institute. The institute yeah. was. It might not have been adjacent. It would be indistinguishable adjacent. from an on-campus indistinguishable, building, right? yes. but it, 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 it may not be liter- you know, yeah. literally yeah. a part of the campus. Yeah, but it feels like it's. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, oh, for sure. yeah, they yeah. do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. mean. The Institute at the University of Utah. Yeah, it was right there. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's huge, yeah. and it, it, it you can't distinguish it from the rest of the campus. USU is like that. Yeah, it is. It's just a weird, both seminary buildings on high school, on oh, yeah. or adjacent to high school oh, campuses yeah. in Utah and Idaho and Arizona, and then institute buildings on or adjacent to campus of universities. Right. It's this real marriage of public education and religious yeah. education slash indoctrination. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of a really powerful and some would say questionable merging of church and state. Yeah, right? I don't know if the ACLU has ever taken that one <laughs> on. But it's kind of blurry. Yeah, it's a, a little bit, bit blurry. A, a little bit is a gray area. But, but, but when you're in it, area. it's amazing, <laughs> right? It. When yeah. you're in it, yeah. you're like, well, of course, because <laughs> this is what my life's about. Right. So if it were somewhere else that I had to drive to, well, then that wouldn't work. Because this is what life is. And it just was a way for us to keep the church as the center of life, not only spiritually, but for fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, we met. I don't remember very much about that. You want me to tell you how we met? Sure. Okay. Um, I was supposed to come, and she was supposed to be at the Institute building, and my buddy said, hey, come, because she said she was going to be there that day at class with her mom. And um, he said, come come see her. And so I remember pull up at, pulling up into the parking lot, and Nan and uh, one of her best friends named Denise Tyner were standing in the door, and I remember the first time I saw her, she was... I didn't know it was her, but I thought, okay, that's probably the girl that I'm supposed to meet. That's the description. And I can tell you what she had on. Oh, really? She had, yeah. She had Let these, us have it. She had, she had uh, boots on, these brown boots, and she had these stovepipe Levi's on. And then she, on, had, she, she, she had a waist, um, a, 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 a jacket that went down to her waist, kind of like a bomber jacket. Oh with, yeah, with kind of a, a fuzzy collar on her right here, and uh, she looked really cute. And um, <laughs> man, you were styling even then. <laughs> yeah, and, that's questionable. <laughs> and she was standing at the door. She and Denise were standing at the door, and I think they were looking for me to yeah. find out. Okay, is this guy going to come or not? And I pulled up, and I remember opening the door and said hi, and they said hi, and they didn't. I don't think they knew it was me, but I walked into the into the Institute and there was my buddy there and then she walked in later and sure enough, it was Mm -hmm. her. So Mm -hmm. that was my, that was the first time that we met. Okay, good. And I was happy with what I saw. Yeah. And so he asked me out and, um, when it came time for our date, he didn't tell me what we were going to do or where to go or how to dress. So, I mean, I was 18. He was, I didn't know how old he was. He looked like he was, you know, 18. Um, he was but, 23, right? He would have been 23. I, I, was, I was a few days from being 24, okay. yeah. but I told her I was 23. Okay. <laughs> and um, 
So we were home and he knocks on the door and I send my sister out there, go see, you know, what is he wearing so that I even know am I dressed right or whatever. And uh, I had on jeans and whatever. And she came back in and she said, well, first of all, he's really cute, but you should probably change out of those jeans and put on something nicer because he's dressed you know, like he's going somewhere. So I heard him changed into something else. And when I came out, he was wearing, um, we used to call them angel flight pants, but they were uh, polyester pants that were bell bottoms. Oh, and yeah. then he had on a polyester shirt that had palm trees all, all over it with big, long pointed collars <laughs> and a little braided belt that had huh? palm trees on it to match his shirt. Oh, wow. Like, gosh, gosh, gosh. And... No. I just thought, well, coordinating. Okay. Wow. And, you know, I didn't know he was older than me. I didn't know that he just got back from a mission and was still wearing clothes from way back when. I didn't know any of that. I just thought, well, okay, he is really cute. So here we go. <laughs> she was not impressed with my wardrobe. <laughs> and after about <laughs> four dates, I, um, and I thought I was going to end up going out with him for a while. I bought a pair of those Levi's we had back in the day called Shrink to Fit, and you would buy them, and they were huge, and then you would shrink them, and they would then they would fit you. Uh. So you could not return them then because they were shrunk. So I bought a pair that would that I thought would fit him, and I washed them and shrunk them so you couldn't take them back. And then I put them in the back seat of his car one day when he wasn't watching, and I didn't say anything about it. And he didn't say anything, but the next time he came to get me, he was wearing those, and he looked even more cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fashion, so, yeah, fashion wasn't my strong yeah. suit, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Case. So the that initial outfit that you wore was it out of style? Or that what? I wore. Yes. yes. Oh, definitely. Oh, Very. It was out of style. <laughs> oh, Very. got it. Yeah. Okay, so you gave him a little update. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so humane. Yeah. Such a humane <laughs> way. <laughs> Well, really suggestion. quickly, in Mormonism, there's kind of a pecking order. It would be like, you know, young men of pioneer ancestry, you know, or related to important Mormons as kind of like top on the pecking order. And then like at least born in the covenant, returned missionaries, a convert maybe would be without pioneer ancestry would probably be lower on the pecking order. Now, I don't know if I'm imposing this or if I'm making that up. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious whether that pecking order was in any way conscious for you. Mm, not really. Okay. Um, I would have never considered marrying anybody who wasn't a, a return missionary. That was out of the question. I dated a few kids like that, but I certainly knew that wasn't who I was going to marry. And I looked at it, you know, I'd just been taught to see the good in everything and to trust God. So I looked at it like, wow, what faith he must have to have not known anything about the church and then seen the truthfulness of the gospel at a young age and knew it was true and joined in. And I thought, you know, he's really um, brave and intelligent to have done that, uh, mm -hmm. coming from a family that wasn't religious in any way. So yeah. I thought, wow. And and he presented himself when we were dating and forever after, not like just when we were dating, as a very straight, toe the line, do not step one toe off the line kind of guy, which was my kind of guy, you know, mm. when it came to getting married. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And her dad liked me a lot. So if her dad hadn't liked me, I would have been out the door in a heartbeat. <laughs> But yeah, by, from her, by her. Oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. somehow I made a good impression on her dad. Yeah, and, yeah. And, right from the get-go. And we got along great, and he liked me. So I really believe that that's most of the reason she married me, frankly. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah. dad's seal of approval. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that was, yeah, that was 90%. That was important. That was 90% of it for me. No, it wasn't. <laughs> 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 Anything you guys want to say about? your engagement or wedding or the temple, you know, going through the temple or any of that stuff? Ooh, I can tell you about my first temple experience, but yeah. I, mean, I don't know if we want to go yeah. there. But go ahead. If it's important to your story. <laughs> I think it is. Uh, just, and I'll try to be brief. Um, nobody told me about the temple. I'm, I'm this 
kid who you know, didn't grow up with Mormons, and I'm getting ready to go on a mission, and I go in for my interview, and okay, you're going to go in the temple, great. And uh, uh, I went through with Nan's family, not Nan's family, but Lark's family, my, my <laughs> girlfriend's family at the time. Um, and uh, I didn't really know what to expect, but I did not expect what I ran into uh, when I went there. Um, the washing and anointing uh, was traumatizing. Um, you know, you have to get naked and then you put on this shield, they call it, which is uh, basically a, a poncho that's opened on both, you know, on both sides of you. And then I have these guys, you know, touching me uh, under the poncho and then they put with on the, the garment. Right? Yeah. With oil. With oil, they, you know, and then they, they touch me, you know, inside my chest and then then down by my groin, which was weird, and then my knee. And, you know, I, I just said, what is going on here? You know, I'm a just, I'm a kid who, you know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know any of this stuff. What What is this? I just thought, okay, we have this great church that where we, you know, we want people to be happy and, you know, believe in Jesus and, and do good things. And then I walk into this, it was like a buzzsaw. And then after that, you know, we had the endowment. And during the endowment in those days, I mean, I'm standing there, and then there we're doing this stuff, and I'm acting like I'm cutting my throat with my hand, and then I'm disemboweling myself, you know, at my chest, and then again down at, you know, in my at my waist. And I'm going, what in the heck is going on here? And 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 then, you know, we're we're raising our hands and chanting in this weird language. Adem Adamic language. Oh, and is going down and everybody's doing it and we're wearing these weird clothes. It's just like, what the heck am I doing here? And you know, everybody told me the temple's so great. And then I said, oh my gosh. And I remember just hoping this gets over soon. And I remember going home after that and I was so mentally exhausted. I st I was I couldn't get out of bed for the rest of the day. I didn't know what to do. Yeah, it was the one of the most difficult mental experiences of my life. I can compare it to being on the witness stand um, mm -hmm. as an FBI agent. Mm -hmm. The the mental energy that that of that day is comparable to the mental energy you spend when you're getting interrogated by defense attorneys trying to trip you up. Yeah. And it's, it was just awful. Wow. Um, and that was supposed to be this great experience. And, and uh, I never recovered from that, frankly. Mm. I never did. Even though I was faithful and I went to the temple, I, ne I never did enjoy the temple, mm -hmm. you know, in my days. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tried, mm -hmm. you know, I tried to get everything I could out of it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, it, it may, mostly in the celestial room when it's all finished and it's, you know, you sit in this peaceful room where it's really quiet, you know, yeah. I have some good memories there, but, but not a lot. And, a, and I see this on the internet all the time. Mormons today will go, well, that's not how the temple is. And it's like, yeah, oh. they changed it, but that's how it was when we went through oh, it. Oh, my gosh. And and since we were taught it was given to the church by revelation from God, it's a non-trivial thing that we had to go through it and that we were told it was from God. So why did they change it? Yeah. Why, why do we have to go through it? And then what are they doing changing mm -hmm. God's sacred revelatory ordinance? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Amen. Yeah. yeah, that's why I'll never stop having people tell that story yeah. <laughs> until the church somehow accounts for what we all had to go through. Yeah, yeah. Because it was, I don't know, at best culty and weird, and at yeah. worst, violent and abusive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is that well, overstating well, it? No, that's not overstating <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah you it know, was. We, our 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 first 
son, our first child was born 11 months after we were married because mm-hmm. they told us birth control was a bad thing. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And so we didn't do it. So we talked about it before we were married. And and we, said, we, no, we, we did will our follow best. the prophet. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, we. So we had three kids about as fast as you could have three kids. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, and nobody ever said, okay, it's, you know, it was, it was bad until it wasn't bad anymore. And, you know, where was that transition? Yeah. Um, you know, we really could have used somebody saying, you know, it's okay. You can, it's all up to you. But uh, when we were married, it wasn't up to us. It mm-hmm. was a bad thing to mm-hmm. practice birth control. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it sounds like you had, you went through the temple with your mission. So you had been mm-hmm. through the temple by the time you, before you were married. Mm-hmm. Now, had you been to the temple? No. Okay. So. No. How did that go for you? So well. Um, uh, my mom had prepared me extremely well. And uh, I had grown up learning how to iron by ironing her temple clothes. And I thought they were beautiful and so special. And she told me, you know, and my dad's temple clothes too, so I knew all of that. She told me about some of the stuff that would happen in the temple. She said, you're going to feel like it's strange and not what you're used to, but don't worry about remembering it all because they'll tell you what you need to know. So there's no need for you to be worried at all about this experience because it's going to be nice and it's, um, you'll get used to it over time. So don't worry. And that's exactly how I felt. Huh? This is, this is not any, like anything I've ever done before. She was right. And I didn't think everybody looked weird. I'd seen all the clothes before, and there was Rod to pull me through the veil and take me into the celestial room, and all was well. Mm. Such different experiences, <laughs> Absolutely. right? Absolutely. The same, the yeah. same experience, but yeah. different well, reactions to yeah. it. Right? Yeah. Did you like the chef hat, though? I mean, was that Well, I can't to say you? I really liked all of what the guys were wearing, but it didn't faze me because I was 12 years old, pressing yeah. my mom's apron and all the things. You had so. been kind of prepped, it sounds like, uh-huh. honestly. Yeah. Okay, and what about seeing Gordon jump from WKRP in Cincinnati <laughs> in, in the temple ceremony? <laughs> As Peter, yeah. wasn't he Peter? Yeah. Yes, that was fun, was. right? Uh, that was fun. That was good. <laughs> now, that's not a memory everyone has <laughs> of the temple. Oh, yeah. Shows what I did as a young kid. A, re- a really quick uh, <laughs> uh, memory from the temple. I was a tax collector, the first job out of, out of uh, college. And uh, in Ogden. In Ogden. Yeah. I IRS. worked for the Utah Tax uh-huh. Commission. Because IRS has a thing there. Yeah, I went to the U- work for Utah Tax Commission, but it, it was Utah. And one of the people I met, uh, for some reason, I don't think I was collecting taxes from him, but he was there. He came into my the office, and I recognized him. <laughs> he was the guy in the—he was Adam in the temple, oh. the temple <laughs> film, the very first Adam oh. in, the, in the temple film. And I said, I— know you. Yeah. And he said, yeah, you probably do. <laughs> and do you know what his name was? Adam. Adamson. Oh. <laughs> his last name was Adamson. Wow. I don't know that's if that's funny. a coincidence or not, but he was a really nice guy. Anyway, <laughs> little aside. All right. Well, um, I, I guess I'd like to make sure and really solidify kind of what the covenant or commitment was between you marriage wise in terms of what you were agreeing to in terms of, you know, because, because Nan, when you were talking about your, what you loved about the church, you said it simplified things. And what I think you meant by that is you, it just, it gave you the plan. I call it getting on the Mormon train mm-hmm. because you don't have to worry about where you're going or how you're going to get there. You just get on the train and you end up where the train's going. Yes. And that's kind of what Mormonism can offer, mm-hmm. a simple, pre-thought-out plan that's going to get you from A to Z without you even having to worry about it. And, and sadly, that's what I thought it would continue to do. Um, well, when I say sadly, what I mean is I thought that's all you needed in life was to have faith. If you had faith, that Heavenly Father was directing your life, uh, that's all you needed to have a good life. So, you know, my mom didn't prepare me for marriage, for, 
you know, he's going to think one way and you're going to think another. I mean, I was 19 when we got married and I'd never lived anywhere but Ogden, Utah. And I stayed living at home. Of course, we were only 10 minutes from the college. So I had never lived on my own. So I got married thinking, well, this is the right way to do everything. So of course, we're going to do it the right way. And if he, if Rod had a different idea, I'd be like, what do you mean that, you know, we don't wash dishes that way or we don't, whatever it was. Um, and I knew he didn't have a ton of direction at the time we got married. He was finishing up his bachelor's degree. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He didn't have a serious job by then. And I did. And I knew I was going to be a nurse. And then I graduated and I was a nurse. And so it gave me even more reason to think, well, the way I grew up and the things I learned are the right way. And this is where it gets you. And let me show you the way, mm. dear husband. Mm. And um, that, you know, that only works for a little bit. And then, uh, so, yeah. So it didn't take long for us to start or for me, I should say, to start seeing, wait a minute, I have all the faith in the world um, and I'm, I'm doing everything. What has Heavenly Father got in mind with this? Because this is kind of hard. Mm. And You uh, mean our marriage? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought and everything it sounds was great. Like, it sounds like you're kind of saying, too, that you really felt like you had the right way. Oh, yes. Too. Oh, so yes. I have faith and I have the right way. Uh-huh. Yes. So so how can I get him to see the right way? That was it more than, oh, we need to sit down and talk about how we view money, for example. And uh, my parents were super careful with money because my dad was sick all the time and we didn't know if he was going to be able to work or whatever. Where Rod grew up in the military, his they didn't have a ton of money and, uh, they were, they handled it differently. So I just thought, here, let me show you how the right way is to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're saying marriage was more difficult and maybe not as uh, per all, all as joyful as you thought it would be. Correct. Mm -hmm. And Rod, are you saying you didn't notice you, you were loving? I was, I was in heaven. <laughs> It was bliss for me. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the obviously that, that means the, that I was I was pretty stupid because I didn't realize that she was thinking something else. And maybe the patriarchy is suited to the male's happiness mm -hmm. more than the woman's. No question about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. And also, I had learned to keep my needs down, mm -hmm. and so I didn't say. I really need this from you. I need an occasional validating mm -hmm. comment or, you know, I had a baby, this baby, I was barely 20, didn't know what the heck I was doing. Um, and I, I was like, you know, how about, and I didn't say this, but in my mind, I thought he thinks I'm a terrible mother. He thinks I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and I didn't know how to say, oh, I need you to be supportive of me. I'm doing the best, best I can. I didn't know how to say that. So instead, uh, inside, I, I struggled a lot. Mm -hmm. Pretty yeah. much, you know, within a year or two after our marriage. You build up some resentment when you do that, right? Over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. it anxiety? Was it depression? Was no. It resentment? It was no. Just resentment. Yeah. And I can't say I was resentful until many years, many years in, I just felt like, wow, I don't know how to do this marriage thing very well. It's the first thing in my life that uh, having a lot of faith isn't getting me through. Mm. Margie, is this reminding you of Stephanie Brinkerhoff's interview? A little bit. Yeah, just, just like women have this wonderful life before and then they start doing the Mormon mom role with kids really quickly. Mm. And the joy doesn't always come mm -hmm. like they think it's going to come. Yeah. 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 Especially yeah. if they had accomplishments before. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, yes. that's taken away mm -hmm. and the kids start coming really quickly. A lot of Mormon women 
as I understand it, experience depression uh-huh. and anxiety or just yeah. unfulfillment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And isn't it true, Han, that you didn't say much to me? I mean, you, you didn't yeah. complain. No, I didn't uh, complain. Even it was I her. learned she didn't. really she didn't well right? to not complain. That childhood. You know, and I'm you're going along up thinking, oh, this modeled. is great. You know, life yeah. is great. You know, everything's wonderful. And, uh, um, oh, and I never would have said, I'm not happy. That's terrible. Hmm. I need to learn how to be happy. I just saw it on me. Mm. Like, I got to figure this out. Mm. And no, it's not his fault that he didn't understand that I was struggling. Mm. Um, And I loved being a mom and loved having those kids. It was the marriage that was hard. Mm. Mm. And I might might add, too, that... um, her love language is um, what? What do they call it? Affirmation. Words. Words, Words of affirmation. Mm-hmm. And um, we didn't know. I any didn't of do that a very then. good job at that. I, I'm I'm sure I didn't. And you know, we didn't know any of that. But I, I don't think I was great at that anyway. You know, probably as a young you, man, you weren't modeled that. No, but and and she, you know, she probably could have used a lot more of that that I didn't give her. So. Um, yeah, we yeah. we <laughs> we're still you know, on we a journey. You know, we yeah. were just blind. We yeah. went into yeah. this blind yeah. because any any worthy man can marry any worthy woman and be blissful, right? That's and, right. Um, yeah. I believed that. So did I. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. That's powerful. Okay. Okay. So, um, you end up having how many kids total? Well, we had three kids. And then I said, okay, I got to have a break. Oh, wow. Um, the third one um, had a seizure disorder as a baby, which was Sally. And uh, she, they put her on seizure medicine, which made her super hyperactive. So that just made everything even more difficult. And, I, and Rod um, got an MBA from Utah State while I was having those three kids. And then he got hired by the FBI as an FBI agent. And we moved from Utah to Kansas City when that third child was five weeks old. So we left Utah, the only place I'd ever lived. We left being 10 minutes away from my parents, um, all of that and all the Mormon community and went to Kansas City. And I had this super fussy baby and these two tiny toddlers who were one and three and um, mm. and mm. a marriage mm. that I was trying to figure out how to do. That'd so be a yeah. big adjustment. That was that a big a adjustment lot. for me. Whoa! Uh-huh. And you hadn't been on a mission. No, so. no. Yeah, Mm-mm. leaving Utah with yeah. young kids. Yeah, yeah. And we we hadn't done tra- much traveling when I was growing up. You know, uh, we probably would have done more if my dad was sick, wasn't sick. So I hadn't ever seen, you know, we'd been to Disneyland once and to Yellowstone most summers, and that was that. So I didn't know. I remember Kansas City had different kind of trees than Utah had and a different kind of climate. And when it rained, it came down so differently than the rain in Utah. And I took my camera out and took pictures like, what is happening here? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. And your whole family, your dad had, would, would have still been alive oh, when yes. you moved to Kansas yeah. City. Mm-hmm. And your whole family system would have been built around caring for him. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So leaving your dad yes. behind must have been really yes. hard. And he was um, getting worse. He was getting worse. By then, it was getting to where we thought inside ourselves, we were like, okay, he's, he's never going to get all the way better. This is going to be the end of him and that and kind of thing. You could die while you're away. Yeah, for right? sure. For oh, sure. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like Kansas City might have been kind of hard. It was. It and, was and to work, start out with. I was at work a lot too. Yeah. It was his first, you know, time as an FBI agent. He wanted to do his best. And he had one of the biggest cases of his career right from the get-go. Did you train at Quantico? First? I did. In mm-hmm. Virginia? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Quantico. Okay. Yeah, it's on a Marine base. It's the FBI Academy at Quantico. Mm-hmm. And Hoover would have been gone by, by then. Hoover was gone. Uh, Hoover died in 72. And so, uh, yeah, we had a different director. His name was Webster at the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. So was life feeling intense for you too in a different way? Or what, were you just kind of loving it? Like what was your experience in your role right now? You know, I was uh, – 
I was happy. I was, you know, I was thinking, oh, you know, we got the world by the, by the tail. And, you know, I, I, I got this job now. I'm an FBI agent. I'm loving this. I, you know, it's for me, it was a great career. It was perfect for me. Yeah. Um, everybody tell, I've never been diagnosed as ADD, but my kids and my wife tell me I'm ADD. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it was a great career because, you know, it was, it wasn't a process. You had a case You had several cases that you could work. If you got tired of one on your own, you could go do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, you could choose what you did at work. And and for me, that was great. Um, And I was was happy and we were working a lot. Um, uh, FBI agents have a 10-hour workday by design. And um, so I was, Mm. you know, started early and came home, you know, rather late, especially if we had a, a long commute. So... Nan, Nan was home pretty much on her own mm-hmm. until I got home. Yeah, so kind of parallel lives, yeah. separate mm-hmm. but yeah. going on. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's so interesting because as you were talking, Nan, about saying I that you didn't voice to him in particular mm-hmm. kind of the needs that mm-hmm. you were or what you uh, were experiencing, it it's just hitting me the disconnect because you're like, it felt fine to me. Mm -hmm. And then you're having this other experience is that's what happens. Like that's what happens when we don't share and we don't speak our needs is that we're never known. That's exactly what happened. Invisible, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, my mom was my role model. I remember telling that ward when I stood up to introduce myself for the first time in that Kansas city ward, I said, hi, I'm Nan Osborne. Um, I'm the daughter of Dwayne Bryan. And then I went, "Uh, none of these people know who my dad is. Uh. And I had only introduced myself Mm. as that from the tiny child. Mm. And then I was like, wait. And I went home that day after church thinking, Hmm. I have to be the reason why people like me. (laughs) Because before all I had to do was say I was his daughter and everybody loved me. Mm. Um, and thought well of me and, and knew kind of who I was instantly. Whereas now in Kansas City, I didn't even hardly know where that was on a map at that age. And I had to be the reason why people wanted to be mm. my friend. And that was a new experience for me and not for Rod. So we had a, we had very different experiences like that. Um, Rod's uh, big case gave... He was so excited about that case, and it was really big and on the news and all of that. And he got a lot of props at work, which makes you want to work harder and spend more time there with all the guys who think you're great and and getting all the accolades for this big case that he got and then and then broke off a piece of it to somebody else who got a career making case and somebody else. and and that was exciting and fun. And I had, Three little kids. The littlest one wasn't allowed in the ward co-op babysitting thing because she was so hyperactive and we didn't have money for a babysitter. So it was me and the kids. Rod was an amazing father, such a good father. And the minute he came home, he was all about the kids, 100% with the kids. Like, I don't even know if I ever changed a diaper once he got in the door. Mm. Um, So that was super nice. Um, but as an, as this age, looking back on that, I see that once again, I just, um, it wasn't, he wasn't coming home so much to see me mm-hmm. as the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But of course I didn't, I didn't recognize that at the time and I didn't say anything about that. This is the point. But I loved you with all my heart. I know mm-hmm. that. I know that. <laughs> But yeah, this is the and plight I, of many, many, many Mormon women. Yes. You know? yeah. yeah. And and many, many early Mormon marriages. Divorces. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think and it is. um you can I mean I, I can see that that you know, women just like Nan, you you think, okay, I am supposed to be submissive, I'm supposed to do what he tes- t- says, his you know, the decisions are his, my and she can tell you this, she thought her role was a peacemaker. 100%. Always to be that. And, uh, you know, you just keep that in forever. And then finally you say, I can't do this anymore. And 
the husband is going like, what, 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 what? what's wrong? You know, I thought everything's great. And she's going to, it hasn't been great for a long time. I can't do this anymore. Goodbye. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So after three kids, I put a kibosh on having more kids. And after a couple of years, Rod said, okay, let's have another one. And I'm like, I said, no, we are done. And then a couple of years later, oh, come on. They keep us young. It's so much fun. Uh, you know, I don't care if you have to sleep on the couch for the rest of our lives. I'm not having any more kids. And that went on. And then he'd give up for a while. And then he'd ask me. And after 10 years, um, life wasn't going so perfectly. Um, our three kids uh, were getting to the age where they could get into some pretty serious mischief. And um, I felt like I still hadn't figured out the marriage, and I remember praying one day, Heavenly Father, I don't know how to do this. I, I don't know. I have... Did you reach a breaking point? Yeah. Well, I just said, I, I, don't, I need you to take over. And um, the thought came to me, you should have another baby. And I was like, what in the world? That is the <laughs> last thing I need. But it was loud and clear, and um, I went to Rod and said, hmm. I think maybe we should have another baby. And he was just, I remember him at the breakfast table, and he was trying not to act super excited. And he said, oh, okay, well, that's really great. You know, maybe you should go to the doctor and get checked out before we go any farther. And, and he tried so hard to be calm. And two months later, we were pregnant. So the older kids were 10, 12, and 14 when we had this little guy named Sam. And then two years later, we had a little one named Joe. And the kids by that time were um, 13, 15, and 17. And uh, those two boys are the one of the greatest decisions of our lives, wouldn't mm -hmm. you say, Rod? Yeah. Sam was yeah. born in Houston, by the way. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, they changed the atmosphere of our home. And instead of me being so worried about uh, what our kids were up to, what our teenagers, because by then they were teenagers and in high school, and the oldest couple were, two of them were kind of getting into some mischief. And I was so worried about them and worried about our marriage and all the stuff. And uh, a baby is in the present, it brings you straight back to the here and now. Mm -hmm. The baby is crying. He needs care. You got to feed him. You got to change it up. And all my attention went to him. And suddenly all those things that I was worried about our marriage, worried about the kids, all of that suddenly took a back seat to this baby needs to get up every two hours and I need to feed him and take care of him and all that. And then we need to get pregnant again and have another one so that this one isn't an only child. And then I got two tiny ones trying to end it really did help me because then I was just blissful for a while again with two cute tiny babies. And, and our three older kids adored these boys, like worshiped them. And I want to take them with me to, to do this. And it's mutual tonight, but can I take Sam with me? Because everybody loves Sam. And the two older teenage boys would say, he's a chick magnet. And so they would take this cute two-year-old with them to youth conference that was in our stake center or whatever. And uh, it, it toned down some of the uh, energy that was in our home for having these teenage boys that were, you know, full of wanting to get out and press them, you know, push the envelope and push boundaries and do all these things that made me nervous. Suddenly I, I would see that happening in our home and I would say, here's, hold this baby for a while. I got to run to the grocery store and the energy would just come right mm. down. And I feel like that saved me. Mm. Um, and we had that for a while. So. I don't, Margie, I don't know if you're feeling the same thing or thinking the same thing I am, but that seems so counterintuitive. It's like three kids, yeah. way too many, yeah. no more kids, feeling at the end of your rope. The answer, have two more kids. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Did it you think the same did thing, seem counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But yeah. the answer to being overwhelmed as a Mormon mom with yeah. multiply kids, and replenish the earth. <laughs> yes. And I, 
But that's how it works for you. I knew everybody thought uh, I, we were crazy. Um, and it just gave me another reason to have faith and to say, hmm. we know what we're doing is right. This is what we're supposed to do. So I pressed forward. And, and we had those two little boys. And our oldest son left on a mission. Our second son left on a mission. And then Rod got assigned to Beijing, China. So just as our third kid, Sally, was getting ready to head off to college, we moved to China. So I went from having all of that commotion for so many years and the boys that were hard and all that. And we moved across the world. We just had two cute little blonde boys who were um, six and eight when we got there. And um, my life... Uh, we had wanted to go overseas for a long time, and the FBI had sent Rod to school for a couple of years to learn Chinese. So we were happy to be in China. Um, I had a full-time housekeeper slash nanny slash cook slash laundry person. She did everything. And my life was so good. So again, I didn't come to a point where I said, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm, I'm done. You know, I can't do this thing. Our marriage was still tricky, but now we were in China and it was an adventure and I was so happy to be there. And I just had these two cute little boys who would do anything, you know, okay, kids, we're going to go see some more ancient temples today. Okay. And, and, uh, and you had support. So much support. Working for the embassy gives you a lot of support as it is. And then China had a huge embassy. So all these Americans working at the embassy, we had 17 Mormon families just in our little neighborhood uh, who went to our ward. And that's just part of it. And they were all super strong and faithful. And our, our ward became the center of our lives there. And uh, I had tons of support for that. So Rod, again, worked long hours there and had a lot of responsibility. But I was supported by everybody. And I had these two cute boys who never said, uh, you know, never complained, never said, no, mom, I don't want to do that. And so life got way easier. And so there I was keeping everything inside still. Mm, okay. So it felt a lot easier because a lot of external circumstances and kind of had changed, yes. but actually on the inside, you're, you know, nothing you, it's not that you were doing something different. No. Okay. No, mm -hmm. it was the external life, um, yeah. changed so much in one fell swoop from having teenagers and worrying about, you know, this one's going to get sent to juvenile hall if he doesn't straighten up. And this one's going to get kicked out of school if he doesn't straighten up. All those teenager angst that I'd had for years, they're gone. They went on missions. Sally's off at college. And I just had these obedient little kids and all, all these women who were in the same place I was overseas, not having any family there. We became each other's family. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the external things changed. Inside, I berated myself by that point for not being able to figure out um, other things, you know, like our marriage. I was still like, wow, Nan, you've been married a long time and you are still not good at this. How long is it going to take you to get good at this? That was tricky. Because you didn't feel happy and fulfilled in the marriage? Well, I don't want you to get me wrong. We had so, so many good times. So many. Sometimes we it's about expectations. Yeah. I think that's it. You know, I thought everything was great. Yeah. Yeah. Rod grew up in a family where... <laughs> I did. I, I had no clue that she was going through this. Yeah. yeah. And, and no one in our home growing up, um, we didn't argue. We didn't get upset yeah. because at all times my exactly. dad's life was looming in the balance where Rod grew up in more typical home where if you get mad, you yell at each other. You might even, you know, throw a pan at him if you got really no, mad that would be you. or whatever. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and so, so we, I had different expectations than what I was having, than what reality was. And well, when, you, um, when you say your parents never fought in front of you or whatever, like, yeah. 
That's a, that's exceptional. Yeah, but that's I thought it normal. was. I thought it was normal. <laughs> and your dad like. Oh. Having a lazy boy chair in every room so he could never not be with your mom. Yeah. Like or, that's beautiful or, and like unheard of. And exactly. your dad right? is like suffering from this debilitating illness and like bolstering all those who yes. come to him yes. so yes. that they also yes. not typical. Yes. Yeah. So in yes. many ways, it's a beautiful and a super atypical upbringing that sets you up for expectations yes. uh-huh. in a marriage. Mm hmm. Where Rod's, fat, I'll say fat, dumb, and happy, like loosely. Yeah. And you're just saying what's wrong yeah. with me. And uh-huh. you're internalizing it. Yes. Like it's always you because you can't yes. voice it. And um, the first time we had a serious argument, we'd been married, you know, maybe just under a minutes. year. And um, I thought for sure we would get divorced because mm. I'd never yeah. witnessed an argument like that. I didn't know people did that only in a terrible movie that I wouldn't watch anyway. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was, yeah, so I, thought it, I thought it was, so uh, that's, different. you know, it was normal. That's just right? yes, your perception you of conflict and, okay. yeah. or, you know, even differentiation or mm-hmm. disagreeing mm-hmm. was so skewed. Mm-hmm. So that, yes. Yeah. And yeah. and having seen my mom and dad be so close and so tight, physically, emotionally, yeah. in every way, spiritually. And then for me to just assume that's what everybody did and that that's what I would have. And then to have these times on occasion where I didn't feel that. And w- I, I'm probably misrepresenting our marriage. Can we make a couple of things clear? Yeah. <laughs> um, was I really mean? No, no, I, no. I mean, did I? No. Did I hit you? Did I <laughs> abuse you? Never, did, ever, oh, ever. Okay. Just, never. Okay. No, he was, and I, I am misrepresenting it. That's why zero in in expectations. Yeah. Yes. Like yes. Life, life uh-huh. can be framed by what expectations yeah. we bring right. to something. Yeah. 100%. And it's sounding like at least some of your pain is actually your relationship with yourself, too. Mm-hmm. Your expectations for how it should feel mm-hmm. for you. Yes. Um, as you're kind of, is that right? Yes. Yes. How I should feel. Um, I needed to keep a perfect house. I needed to keep thin. I needed to do all the things like my mom taught me that were important. I needed to take care of everybody. And if there were kids or husbands that weren't all the way happy, then I needed to fix that. And that Mm -hmm. was my job. I, again, I didn't think it out exactly like that in real life, but that's exactly how I felt. And so I just, when there was an issue in anything, I felt like, oh, I, I'm not doing this right. I got to figure something else out. And this was before the days of the internet or anything. One time I went to, to the library to, to see if I could find a book that would help me. And I didn't know if I should get a book by Freud or what I should do because I didn't know where to turn. And of course I never said one single word about any of that to anyone ever. And again, part of this is just traditional gender roles Mm -hmm. within Mormonism. Very much. Where mm-hmm. women are stay at home, have lots of kids and yeah. don't have a career, don't have personal interests. Yeah. Serve your husband, serve your kids. Yep. Maybe maybe not a lot of self discovery or activities that are intrinsically uplifting or rewarding yeah. on their own, separate mm-hmm. from your kids and husband. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And you go to Uh, church activities like homemaking meeting. Uh, It's all about how to cook better food so your husband will like it better, (laughs) how to keep a better house. Those kinds of things are what we were taught back then at homemaking night. And um, so it was even more of you're responsible for making everybody happy. And here's, let us teach you another way on how to do that. It was not about here's how to figure out a difficult challenge in life. You don't talk about your difficult yeah. challenges. Yeah. Yes, that makes all the sense in the world, actually, how you ended up there. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And please don't think that I'm saying Rod wasn't a good guy. Yeah, he was good. very good. I mean, he was the dad for all five of our kids that every kid wanted. And we had all the kids at our house because Rod was there and 
having fun with them and, and in the middle of all their games and capture the flag and all that, he was the guy. We'd have birthday parties for our kids. They didn't want, they didn't need a clown. They didn't need somebody else to come in. Rod made everybody have fun at all the stuff. Yeah. So, you know, he was a scout leader so many times and, and took our kids with him on scout camp outs. And yeah, he was a fun guy. So yeah, he was a really great guy. <laughs> I think what's, I think what's, important to acknowledge too is not just the roles and what that does with relationship you know within the church but also that for the most part I can't remember a lesson uh, in church I can't remember you know for me growing up um, just my generation this idea of learning about emotional connection learning about, you know, what that looks like in relationship, mm -hmm. how that works, how vulnerability plays into that, mm -hmm. how, and so, you know, yeah, th it's no wonder. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. And you think about, I mean, I never had uh, a priesthood lesson about how to get along with your wife. <laughs> um, you know, it, you know, you just don't, in Sunday school, you just don't talk about those kinds of things. Um, yeah. 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 And I, I never, you know, we never had any counseling. Um, no. We did later, you yeah. know, but, I... but yeah, once she cracked, we did. Um, <laughs> yeah. Foreshadowing. But, yeah. <laughs> That's um, how that works, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Really quickly, what what would your kids likely say about their Mormon upbringing? Was your family stereotypical Mormon to the extent that it could be in terms of like scripture study, family evening, each of you serving in callings. How, how Mormon was your children's upbringing? Yeah. You talk, Rod. Uh, about as Mormon as it can get. Um, yeah, we, I remember, you know, we started our marriage with family prayer in the morning and, and, and family prayer in the evening. We did everything by the book. We studied our scriptures. We, had family home evening. Um, our boys, our kids, Sally included, um, you know, Sally's sandwiched in the middle of four boys. Um, it was very orthodox. Um, Nan and I, everywhere we went, we had responsible callings. Um, didn't take long when we went to a new ward to get a responsible calling. With me, it was almost always with the young men. Uh, I, eventually, I served in a couple of bishoprics, but um, over time, but it was almost always with the young men. You know, I was never a ward clerk or anything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I always took my boys with me. Uh, we had a lot of fun, um, but we expected them to uh, be Mormon kids. You know, we expected them to go to seminary. Uh, we expected them to um, go on missions, which they all did, uh, except for Sally. Um, we were pretty much, I don't know if we were typical. We Our were very orthodox. Yeah. Our yeah. kids tell us now, we didn't realize how strictly we observed the commandments growing up. And now as we're adults and we're meeting other people, wow, our home was very strict. Mm -hmm. And for the non-Mormons that are watching and listening right now, mm -hmm. what were the do's and don'ts in your family home? Just go through the go list. Ahead. You want me to do it? Sure. Uh, the do's were do everything you're supposed to do as a Mormon. In other words, uh, you you pray every morning, you pray every night, you, you, not only with the family, but you do your personal prayers, you read your scriptures every day. With the family, um, we had it with the family day. and with the you know on your own. Um, you keep the commandments. In other words, you don't swear. Um, you don't drink coke. <laughs> we were a no coke family. Um, you uh, you you don't violate the cha the law of chastity or anything close to it. Which means. Which means uh, you know if you have a boyfriend or a girl or girlfriend, you keep your hands to yourself. Um, that didn't work for us <laughs> in every situation. Um, with the kids, you mean? Yeah, with the kids. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's typical of all teenagers, including myself. So, um, yeah, 
Uh, attending church. Attending church. Oh, they, you three know. Three hours you, every Sunday. You go three oh, hours every yes. Sunday. You go to the firesides at night, you know, uh, meetings at night if we have those special meetings. Um, you go every Wednesday to what we called mutual. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, youth, that's not an group, option. Youth group stuff. It's a youth group stuff. Mm-hmm. And if you had extra um, meetings or activities on the weekend, you always attended those. It wasn't a choice. Yeah. State um, trainings and all that. All trainings 100%. and everything. Yeah. When we seminary, m- seminary for your kids? Seminary, no Early question. Early morning seminary. 100%. Always. Um, seminary was required. Sabbath rules? Oh. Yeah, unfortunately, Sabbath rules. We we I regret that we did that now, but um, because... But at the time, what was some it? Of our, our kids, yeah. Some what of our kids the... were were really good athletes, and, and we prevented them from participating in very important mm-hmm. to them, very important contests on Sunday. Um, so what did Sundays look like? Just overview. Go ahead, hon. Um, uh, when little Sam was born, um, every Sunday we would get together. He'd be in the r- stroller, and the rest of us would put on our rollerblades, and we would go all through the neighborhood showing off Sam to all our friends because we thought he was the greatest thing that ever happened, and then just exploring and going in the woods and different things. And later on, Sally said, those were the best Sundays ever, and we just were together, and we did that every Sunday. And one of our other kids said, I hated those Sundays because I wanted to go out and play on my roller hockey team, and you wouldn't let me go. Um, We were really... Uh, And the kids didn't put up a ton of fight about, I don't want to do this. So, you know, there was, um, we we didn't see R-rated movies. We didn't do anything that even remotely looked like we might be breaking a commandment. The kids all did their very best, and that's what we expected. Sports on Sunday? No. No, No, none of that. No, I mean watching TV, sports. Oh, uh, I think we had a while in there where we tried to say no TV on Sunday or only, you know, something, a Disney. Hallmark movie at night. Yeah. Okay. But I'm going to confess. Didn't last. What? That was one of the commandment I wasn't going to keep. <laughs> Which was? Watching sports. On Sunday. On Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I went up and down, but, but yeah, I can't ever say that I didn't, I just completely didn't yeah. do that. I, sports was just so important to me. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just drawn to the Super Bowl or, you know, the college, you know, whatever mm-hmm. college games were on. That was hard for me to stay away from. Okay, that's all right. But from the time our kids were little, they were putting pennies from every dollar they earned in a mission bank. And we talked about the mission all the time. And then when I would fix dinner and it would be food they didn't want to eat, I would tell them, someday you're going to be a missionary and you're going to have to eat food that you've never heard of. Maybe if you go someplace far away, it'll be crazy food. You need to learn to like this different food and eat it anyway and be nice. And there was talk about missions. You know, like we've said here, I was the one home with the kids most of, you know, more of the time than Rod was. And I had a really good relationship with each one of the kids where they would come home from school and sit at the kitchen counter and we would talk for half an hour while I fed them cookies or whatever. And we we were close and I knew what was going on in their lives. And I shared my faith with them every day. At nighttime, when they would go to bed, I would go to each kid and sit on the side of their bed and say, how are you doing? And no matter what their issue was, if they have faith, that'll, that's what you need to get through mm-hmm. this problem. So I really um, used every tactic with love in my heart to teach those kids the right way to go. And what was expected out of them by Heavenly Father. And I taught them, you've been given more than most kids on this planet will ever be given. And here's how you show your gratitude, by keeping the commandments and doing what you're asked to do. And this is the way. So This is the way. way. Yes. This is the way. (laughs) Yes, very much. Why are you nodding, Margie? (laughs) No, it's so familiar. It's so familiar. Mm -hmm. And in order to to just keep up with that, what you're describing. It's no wonder, Nan, that you're having a difficult time, number one, like feeling, doing the work of kind of feeling what your needs are, naming your needs, Mm -hmm. 
and connecting as a couple and trying to figure out kind of how to, yeah, yeah. to connect and build because there that is so effortful. Yeah. It is so effortful. It's just five yes. humans and you're doing this yes. all the time and there's always something to do. There's always some place mm-hmm. to be. There's always, uh-huh. so I'm just feeling mm-hmm. for you. Yeah. I gave a lesson in a young women's class once and it was about mm, something about being a good wife. And um, I told all the girls flat out, your job as the wife is to be the peacemaker in the home. So whatever that takes in your home, Mm -hmm. if you have kids, make sure they've done everything that dad asked them to do before he comes home from work. And as the mom, you need to make sure everything is nice and comfortable for when dad comes home from work. And I taught this whole lesson. And when I came out and all the girls went home, the other young women's leader looked at me and said, what was that? And I said, well, don't you feel that way? You know, we're responsive. That's our responsibility. Oh man, she didn't even have the words to tell me how wrong I was. And so I went on thinking that was the right way. Hmm. Yeah, I need to make a correction. I said some of my kids were were good athletes. They were they were all good, um, and I <laughs> want to make that correction. Um, we prevented them, all of them, each one of them. I can remember now from playing on Sunday. Our young, our older boys were roller hockey players, and they were very good at it. And uh, they made uh, the all star teams when we were in Houston and we wouldn't let them play on those all-star teams because mm, right. uh, they were, they played on Sunday. And then uh, Sally of course was a basketball player and a very good athlete. We wouldn't let her play on Sunday. And then our two younger boys were soccer players, both of them very good. And we wouldn't let them play on Sunday. So yeah, it was. Uh, they didn't ask to play on Sunday ever once. They, they, they knew that they we just wouldn't. Know. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of part of your, family culture at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh And then if you had to describe what your kids took away from their upbringing of what their life needed to be, like the milestones that they were going to have to hit, how -hmm. would you summarize the milestones that your kids left home with? Go ahead and tell them that, what we expected. Well, okay. They, all the four boys were Eagle Scouts and they didn't love scouting but they knew that was not an option. Um, They all four went on missions, did a great job. Uh, Four out of the five are currently married. They were all married in the temple. Um, Those are the milestones. They all graduated seminary. They all married someone who was worthy to go to the temple with them, who also wanted a Mormon lifestyle going forward. Um, All of anything you can think of that the church said, this would be a good idea, then that's what we expected out of them. So they would stay faithful Mormons just oh, like you yes. were, and they would raise their kids yes. to follow same the way. same pattern. Very much. And then their kids would raise their yeah. kids, yeah. and the chain would continue mm-hmm. unbroken. We never thought it would be anything different. That. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's important foundation to lay for what happens oh, next. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't, um, in my mind, there was no other option. This was the path of happiness. There is no other way. <laughs> yeah. Really quickly, because we interviewed Lena, uh, Sal, because we interviewed Sal in our interview with Sal and Lena, um, I'll, I'll just throw this in there. Did you ever have any idea prior to her leaving, graduating, moving on, that she might not be, I can say it vaguely, not like all other kids, mm-hmm. or I could say <laughs> may have been lesbian. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. would you have had any inclination about that? Go ahead. No. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> no yeah, no, none, none whatsoever. Um, we were just so naive, so distanced from that world because we didn't have to deal with it. And we were, I used to tell people even, you know, I mean, as when our kids were teenagers, that the hardest thing to do as a Mormon parent would be to raise a gay child, to know that your child was gay and still raise that kid in the church. I remember saying that many times. And our kids heard that. And our kids heard that. 
Um, but I, I, I was ignorant to what non-heterosexuality was about. Yep. Plain and simple. And I didn't even think about it. We, um, during the pandemic, uh, we gave all of our home videos to our tech-savvy son, and he put them all on YouTube for us. So we have 231 videos on YouTube now that the whole family can watch wherever they are. And when we go back and watch those and we see Sally, we should have had an inkling. Uh, she was um, wearing, you know, her basketball shorts everywhere. She had her baseball hat on backwards. Um, she didn't like being on the girls' softball team because they only care about having matching ribbons in our hair. They don't even care about winning, Mom. Isn't there any way I can play on the boys' team? And so I'd find a way for her to go play on the boys' team where they cared about winning. And she, she did, and she was good. Yeah, she's a really good athlete. And So and, her gender expression was kind of more non-binary yes, or more... Yes, mm. very much, but... You know, and as a little girl, she would cut her hair because she wanted it short. So then people started thinking she was a boy when she was three. And so I went and got her ears pierced. And then in the night, she would take them out. So I didn't notice. And then I had to go get them pierced three times in a row. And then I gave up. Um, things like that a lot. But I just thought, I mean, this is her dad. You know, Mr. Athlete, Mr. FBI, and then she's got two brothers that she thinks are cool that are older and doing all the sports. Of course, she's going to be a tomboy. She doesn't have any other option. Um, you know, I signed her up for ballet classes when she was little, and she said, okay, I'll go. And I bought her the cute little tutu, and I took her off to class. And then when I'd pick her up, she had on her baseball uniform because she had it in her backpack from earlier that day, and mm -hmm. she changed. So... Even when she was tiny, I love um, you know, I, I would make her an Easter dress with all the ruffles and I'd sew and get her all dressed for Easter Sunday church. And then we're sitting there. She was probably four that year and we're passing the sacrament and I pass it to Sally and she's got her cute Easter dress on and her soccer cleats <laughs> instead of the pink patent leather shoes I bought for. Mm. So from a very young age, all the way up through high school, uh, if she, if I was a young parent now and 20 years old and having this child, because of w what I know now and what's out in the world, uh, we would have been clued in for sure. Mm. But Sally was, Sally didn't have an inkling and we didn't have an inkling. Mm. So, yeah. 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 It wasn't a choice. No. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure she told, yeah, she did tell you, but there, there, there was no, you know, any thought of that was just not. An option, mm -hmm. and, you know, her being gay was not an option. Yeah. Did did you ever get a sense that any of your kids, particularly the ones that maybe started having doubts or problems first, did they give you any? Did 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 you ever thinking back have any indication that some of your kids may not be fully on the plan, or that the gospel may not be working for them like it might have been for others? without needing to name names or give any specifics, like mm -hmm. aside from sexuality, mm -hmm. did, did you, did any of you feel like it, it, it wasn't working for some of your kids growing up? Yeah. Yeah. Or um, you can name names, whatever. Yeah. Know, yeah. Uh, Alex, our number, our number two boy, um, you know, all of them did what they were supposed to do. You know, they all went on missions. They all got married in the temple. So we all know the result. Right. But Alex, um, was always a kind of a questioner, curious kind of kid. And I felt that as a, as a dad and one who also taught him as a, a leader in, during his teenage years, you know, and I would teach classes um, when, uh, to him and his friends who were in, excuse me, whatever quorum he was in. Um, he, was, he, was, uh, he's, he was always a little bit cynical. Um. And the first time he went through the temple, when it was time to go on his mission, he was blown away. And um, uh, he said, I don't think I can do this mission thing after, after having been through the temple. Um, but and Would we, that have been before they changed, before 90, or after they after. changed? After. After. So after. They wouldn't have done it was, this was, he no. wouldn't have he graduated in 2002. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, they they didn't have those symbols, but the temple again was still weird. It was still weird, yeah. and um, he said, "Hey, I don't. This stuff is too funky." And um, you know, we talked him into say, "Look, give it a chance." He says, "Okay," because I mean, he grew up in our house, right? Not going on a mission was not an option. And so he got to the MTC. Luckily for him, he got into uh, a group where one of the guys was uh, kind of an intellectual guy, and he had studied masonry and the Mormons, at least the uh, the um, fair Mormon view of masonry and Mormons. And so this kid explained things to him, and he felt a little better. And he went on his mission, and he, he, he was a great missionary, you know? I mean, he because he was a... He was um, he was a very capable kid. He was a very personable um, kid, and and he was a great missionary. He ended, you know he was an assistant to the president. He was really good, uh, and he came home. But when he came home, he was still still Alex. You know mm-hmm. um, that that statement you just made, not going on a mission was not an option. Not an option. You think about the sacrifice a Mormon missionary makes, two years of their life. Yeah. The indoctrination, the Mm -hmm. sacrifice, the risks, the health risks, the psychological risks. It's a massive commitment Uh that you would think like like military service, you would never say you you will serve in in the military. You would want a kid to like choose that, right? Yeah. But in Mormonism, for for many Mormon families, no. there's no. there's no choice. There wasn't a choice. A choice. There that, was it, no choice. I mean, we kind of gloss over that, even mm-hmm. sometimes if yeah. we're not in the church anymore. That's kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge deal. And, and all, it, go ahead. I mean, you know, for me, as a convert, that was a yeah. huge burden on my shoulders. I knew that I could not not go on a mission. I mm-hmm. had to go on a mission. For yourself though. For for me because mm-hmm. I, you know, I had everything I knew and in 1974 uh President Kimball said, you know, every worthy young man should serve a mission and you know, that was a year after I was baptized and not even a year and I had no choice mm-hmm. because I really was 100% dedicated and in. Yeah. Yeah, and our kids um experienced all the things you just talked about, John, of, of all the difficulties of a mission, um, some serious health problems on the mission, all, all different even things. Sometimes abuse. Sometimes missions can be abusive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, the expectation of the mission president, some of them more than others had you know, such high expectations of themselves because of their mission president saying, this is what you need to do, that they just struggled the whole time. Okay, I got to be perfect if I want to baptize anybody. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I'm not, if I don't baptize anybody, that means I'm not perfect enough. What else can I find in my life to be more exactly perfect and come up with all these rules for themselves to try and be more perfect so they could baptize more people. And and um, they did not express all of that to us while they were on their missions. You're not supposed to. You're mm-hmm. not supposed to tell your parents all that. Um, so it wasn't until after they were home and sometimes even years later that they told us some of their experiences and how difficult that was. Mormon missionaries are told if you've got something negative going on, don't write home about it. Right. Don't tell your family. Yeah. Right? Yep. Because so don't. Don't, you don't yeah. want to worry your mom yeah. because by the time she gets your letter, that problem will be solved anyway. No, so, we were specifically told that. Yeah. To you, I mean, we had specific uh, instructions for writing letters when I was on my mission. You write home every week, you don't say anything negative, and you include one spiritual experience from your mission. Mm-hmm. And I did that every yeah. single week. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm.